much. <laughs> Should I do is it again? This is fine, it's fine. <laughs> Not as sweet again. Hi, I'm Dr. Catherine Sanchimino, clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Seaver Autism Center. Hello, I'm Dr. Silvia de Rubais. I'm an associate professor at the Seaver Autism Center for Research and Treatment and Departmental Psychiatry. Hi, I'm Megan Kaplan, and I'm a clinical extern at Seaver Autism Center. So we are here today to address 10 of the most Google questions on autism spectrum disorder. Oh, we got. Okay. I'll take the first question. Yeah, sure. All right. What is autism? Autism is a neurodevelopmental disability that is associated with difficulties in social communication and restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior. And um, social difficulties involve difficulties with social reciprocity, back and forth conversation, as well as difficulties with nonverbal communication, making eye contact, facial expression, um, as well as difficulties forming relationships and maintaining relationships. Um, then there are also restricted repetitive patterns of behavior. Those include uh, motor stereotypies, um, hand flapping is uh, one of the most well known symptom. Um, highly focused interests that are pervasive to all other interests. Um, sometimes a fixation on uh, things being in a particular order or sameness, as well as uh, sensory sensitivities, hyposensitivity, hypersensitivity, um, and sensory seeking behaviors. I'll try this one. What is the cause of autism? So autism is a complex condition with many factors contributing to risk. And over these last decades, family studies and more recently large scale genomic analysis have really pointed to a strong genetic component for autism risk. So just to give you an example to visualize this in monozygotic twins, so twins that share the same DNA. If one child has autism in seven to nine cases out of 10, also the other twin receives the diagnosis. And this concordance in diagnosis drops to one in 10 for fraternal uh, twins. And so this susceptibility for autism lies in genetic lesions that we call mutations that affect the way our genes are working within our cells. And so over the last 10 years, we've made great progresses in identifying these mutations. They can be relatively large, um, you know, spanning one gene or multiple genes, including missing or extra pieces of DNA, or they can be as small as a change in a single letter of our uh, genetic code. Third question. Let's see. Okay. Um, what is the autism spectrum test? So, um, autism spectrum is diagnosed through behavior observations, and there's many different tools that are used to observe these behaviors. Here at Seaver, we use the gold standard assessment, which is called the ADOS, which is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedules, the second edition. So the ADOS might look like me just playing and having fun with your child, but I'm actually looking at their behaviors and seeing if their behaviors are consistent with those that are commonly seen among children on the autism spectrum. Um, but we don't make a diagnosis just from one single diagnostic measure. So we also look at the way your child thinks, also known as their cognitive ability, um, their adaptive skills, so also known as how they do different tasks in daily living. Um, as well as their developmental history, which we get from parent interviews. Sometimes we also ask parents to fill out questionnaires to help us get to know your child a bit more. Um, but we take all these things together and use them with our clinical judgment to make our best diagnosis for autism. All right, what age is autism diagnosed? Well, autism is diagnosed at many different ages, but um, Megan, I'll let you take this one. Okay. So, the American Pediatric Association recommends that pediatricians screen for autism between 18 and 24 months. At about 18 months, we can see that there's more expectations for children. Once they reach 18 months, we start to see a child engaging in more behaviors that we can observe differences in children on the spectrum. However, there's not any age that is too old to diagnose autism. So, here at Seaver, we diagnose autism across the whole lifespan. 
So if an adult comes in for an evaluation, we would provide the same comprehensive evaluation that we would for a younger individual, but we would also want to get a sense of that person's history, their medical background, their early developmental history. We might try to see if there is a caregiver available if one of their parents um, might be able to participate in an interview so that we can understand what was happening in that individual's childhood um, early on. Were there any indications? Because Autism is a developmental dis neurodevelopmental disability and symptoms do need to be present in the early years in order for a diagnosis to be made. So it is definitely the case that sometimes um, individuals can go their whole life without an autism diagnosis, not, in, not get a diagnosis until their 20s or 30s or 40s or later. Um, that sometimes happens for a variety of reasons. It might be that their difficulties were more mild compared to other individuals. It might be that their family of origin um, wasn't connected to resources to get an evaluation for that person. Um, and it might be that their symptoms were more congruent with their age. Um, girls are actually diagnosed um, at a lower rate than boys. And part of the thinking is that um, some of the girl symptoms for girls tend to be more um, congruent with age, such as, you know, maybe a fixation on My Little Ponies, where all they want to talk about is learning about My Little Ponies, but that might not seem abnormal for a little girl. Let's see. What developmental delays are associated with autism? Okay, I'll take this one. Some delays that are common in children on the autism spectrum are cognitive delays, that's de delays in ways of thinking, speech delays, physical delays in terms of motor skills, social delays, and emotional delays. Something we commonly see early is that children aren't gonna respond to their name um, like a non-autistic child would, or um, they're not directing as many facial expressions at their caregivers or other people around them that they know. And lastly, some emotional delays that we commonly see are difficulties with emotion regulation, and that can look like increased frequency or intensity of tantrums. Next. What strategies can be used for autism sensory sensitivities? So sensory sensitivities can be a hyper reactivity to sense sensory experiences. So that could be being extremely sensitive to some things or hypo reactivity, meaning under sensitive, like uh, falling and getting hurt and, and not actually having a, a response to that. Or sensory seeking where someone looks like they're looking for a certain number of sensory sensitivities. What can be used for those problems? So if the sensory sensitivity relates to vision, um, sometimes dimming the lights or creating an environment um, with less distractions or less clutter is really helpful. If it's a sensory sensitivity to noise, often using noise canceling headphones can be helpful. Um, if the child is seeking out touch, um, using kind of a fidget or a necklace that they can chew on can be really helpful. If they're seeking to feel where their body is in space or they really like pressure, sometimes doing like activities that involve heavy lifting or a weighted blanket can be really helpful. Scheduling a bunch of different activities that are gonna help children um, with their sensory sensitivities throughout the day. So they proactively are getting at those sensory sensitivities rather than um, having it disrupt their daily activities. What about the next one? Okay, let's see. Mm. Can genetic testing predict all this? I think I'll take this one. So genetic testing looks for genetic causes of autism but cannot be used to diagnose autism. As we have learned from my colleagues, autism is diagnosed based on observations on the individual's behavior, right? Genetic testing and genetic counseling are important because they can lead to a genetic diagnosis, which can aid in family planning, patient management, treatments, but also empowering families. Genetic testing is important because it can inform uh, research, right? How close do you think scientists are to develop a genetic test for autism, like a blood test for autism? Do you think that's possible at any point? You can use blood to test for genes. So we have, as I said, chromosomal microarray. You can have specific testing for fragile X. You can have gene panels. And so some of the large scale genomic efforts also led by the Severs Center have gone into uh, augmenting the these gene panels and then you can do like some sequencing but you're always screening for a genetic mutation associated with autism. Make sense? Yeah. 
is there a diet that is best for autism? I'll, I'll answer that one. So no, there's no diet specific to autism, but autistic people, just like non-autistic people, can have food allergies, food okay. sensitivities, and if you're eating food that gives you gastrointestinal distress or makes you physically uncomfortable, you're probably going to be pretty irritable and moody. You might not sleep well right. because of those issues. Um, and uh, autistic individuals might express their irritability and moodiness a little bit differently. From the outside, it could look like the food is causing an increase in autism symptoms, when really probably what it's doing is causing some physical discomfort um, that should be addressed. And if I may add on that, there is a lot of conversation about the gut microbiome, right, in autism spectrum disorder. But there is actual evidence that shows that these alterations in gut microbiome are actually reflective of those dietary preferences that might be associated with autism spectrum disorder per se. So it's not the other way around, right, where the gut microbiome has um, a causal role in autism. I see. So someone with autism who is sensitive to particular textures. Like and, a picky eater, right? right? Yes. And yeah. they only eat certain foods can result in a exactly. gut microbiome. And potentially gastrointestinal issues as well, right? Yeah. Okay. Is there a vaccine that causes autism? So this is a big deal. I want to take this one. Um, no, there's not a vaccine that causes autism. Um, that was the result of a uh, fraudulent study published in 1998 that was later retracted from the medical journal that it was published in. And um, the lead author of that article actually lost his license to practice medicine. And the really sad part about that is that it resulted in um, a massive reduction in people um, allowing their children to be vaccinated with the MMR vaccine. And that was the false link that was made. And because of many children were no longer vaccinated, those children were then contracting measles, mm -hmm. which is a um, disease that had been eradicated. But if you don't continue to vaccinate um, for diseases like that, they will come back. But many studies since then have been um, have been shown that there is no link between yeah. the MMR vaccine uh, or thimerosal and um, autism. The CDC has published many of these studies, so it's really, really clear that there's no link between vaccines and autism. The last one. How do you call a person with autism? By their name, by their name, what they prefer to be called. But if you're talking about their diagnosis, um, you can say they have, they're autistic. Uh, they have an autism spectrum diagnosis. Um, you know, it's, this is an important question because individuals who have an autism diagnosis, who are able to engage in academic discourse at a high level and are able to represent themselves, will let you know what their preference is. But there's a lot of individuals that we see um, at Zebra Autism right. Center who might not have the ability to talk, who can't represent themselves, um, who can't really say what their preference is. And those are the individuals that really do still need a lot of help um, to gain more independence in life. Asperger's was a diagnosis previous to 2013. Um, the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, that's how we make any sort of mental health diagnosis. It's updated periodically. And in the 2013 update, the Asperger's diagnosis name was actually removed from the DSM. Uh, so was PDD NOS, that's pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. That was also removed from the DSM. Now there's just one diagnosis called autism spectrum disorder that um, encases all three of those previous diagnoses. If you have any additional questions about autism, if you want to learn more, if you have concerns about any of your loved ones, Seaver Autism Center is always here for you. Voila! <laughs> I don't think that was good.